Welcome to Whiskey Cast, cask strength conversation featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 888 for August 11th, 2021, the podcast version of our latest Happy Hour Live webcast. Last Friday night, we were joined by Scott Neal, one of the co founders of Horse Soldier Bourbon, and Nick Ravenhall. He's the managing director at Hollyrood Distillery in Edinburgh. But he and his brother Alex also have a side hustle of sorts. They're known as the Whiskey Smugglers. And last weekend, they led a team of open water swimmers across Scotland's Cory Brecon Whirlpool with small bottles of whiskey strapped to them. Those whiskeys will be sold later this year to raise money for Sea Shepherd's ocean protection programs in New Zealand, where the Ravenhall brothers were born. Thanks again to our presenting sponsors, Redbreast and Doers, for making these webcasts possible each week, along with our segment sponsors on the podcast each week, Oban, Sagamore Spirit, and Writer's Tears. Remember, our Friday webcasts use a streaming platform that focuses on video quality over audio quality, so there will be occasional glitches from time to time. But I can't blame that for my forgetting to unmute my microphone after our opening video. It works a lot better when we unmute the microphone, guys. Unmuted the wrong one. Ah, lovely. I love it when I do that. Uh, Hey, thanks for joining us today. I'm Mark Gillespie. Welcome to the Happy Hour Live webcast from WhiskeyCast.com. Juggling mic buttons and doing a one-man band production. Welcome to live webcasting. Let me bring in our guests right now. Whoops, uh, just a second here. And uh, let's bring the guys in. Scott Neal, one of the co-founders of Horse Soldier Bourbon, and Nick Ravenhall, has to have done one of the craziest damn things I can just imagine <laughs> the other day with his brother and some friends swimming across the Cory Frecken Whirlpool in Scotland off the coast of Jura. You know the Whirlpool. It's the one that George Orwell of 1984 fame damn near drowned in uh, <laughs> shortly after World War II after he wrote the book and everything. And sailors have been complaining about the Cory Frecken for years. Well, Nick and his brother and some folks swam for charity. We're going to explain that. And we're going to talk with Scott Neal, one of the founders of Horse Soldier Bourbon, uh, with an interesting and very timely story. And I want to start off with you, Scott, because uh, give us the origin story behind Horse Soldier, because uh, you and your colleagues in the Army Green Berets were some of the first Americans to lead the invasion of Afghanistan after 9-11. And with the U.S. now pulling out, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But I would uh, like you to give us the origin story behind how you guys became horse soldiers. So let's talk about the horse soldier soldier part before the horse soldier bourbon part. Horse soldiers was a moniker given to uh, the United States Army Green Berets that were initially inserted um, 19 October 2001. When 9-11 happened, of course, it was a shock and surprise to everybody in America around the world. And as the country was reeling, watching TV, President Bush said, I need a response. And if you think about, you know, Pearl Harbor and all of these other attacks in America, you know, there, there needs to be something that gets the country's confidence back. So the decision was to send in small teams of Green Berets behind the lines, along with their agency partners, to link up with any kind of resistance that get ground intelligence and understand how the Taliban had allowed Al Qaeda to use their country as a front and also, you know, grow themselves to deliberately attack the United States. So in as little as a hundred days, a hundred Green Berets and our partners overthrew the Taliban and we pushed Al Qaeda back into Pakistan. Uh, you know, the rest of the history with bin Laden and, Pakistan, but yet here we are today, 20 years later. And explain this photo to us. Ha! Uh, that was a younger and thinner Scott. Uh, we are in, we finally made a push into Kandahar, and that is the airfield. Uh, of course, we, we, we thought we could look like indigenous folks. Most Afghan men were, you know, five foot five and 120 pounds, and most of us were six foot and 220. 
And but we fought how they fought. You could see a lever action, uh, actually a bolt action infield and a shotgun. There we go. I I received. A, I took the shotgun from an old man on an objective one day, and you could just see how most of us would lose 20 to 30 pounds over the next you know 100 days because we only ate what our Afghan partners would eat. We wanted to blend in. We wanted to feel like we were part of their tribe as we went on the battlefield. So how did you transition from that to this today? <laughs> well, that photo is actually from the thoroughfare in Yellowstone. So, so let's fast forward. You know, we left Afghanistan. We were the first ones into Iraq. Uh, we came home for a few months and then we went into Africa. Then we went back to Iraq. So this war has been carried on quietly by uh, Green Berets, you know, we're quiet professionals. And at some point you have to retire. Either you retire or you're killed or injured or, you know, what are you going to do when you retire? So in 2015, that photo, we actually decided to go to Yellowstone and just clear our minds and come back to nature and just really find out what we wanted to do. So we did a 10 day horse and mule train through the thoroughfare. And as we uh, gave the horses back to the guides, we were going out the back gate of Yellowstone in Utah, and we found our first craft distillery called the Grand Tetons. And like everybody else, I'm sure that's out there in your podcast, you know, we just wanted to see, um, you know, how it was made. And that started our journey to actually travel the world, learn how to make uh, whiskeys and tequilas and and bourbons and we started uh, making our own bourbon by the end of 2015. And you're doing it in Ohio right now, correct? We did. We we didn't have enough money initially to kind of build out our own distillery. So we were introduced to a gentleman named Ryan Lang. Ryan had just built this beautiful $15 million facility and we were mostly asking can we just come and just work, right? And understand uh, a distillery that size. And eventually, he would allow us on the weekends to start making our own. So we would put away 50 barrels, you know, 70 barrels. Then we would take Allegiant Air and fly up there, Airbnb it. And so far today, now we have 11,000 barrels that are aging. And now uh, we've announced recently that we're building our own distillery in Somerset, Kentucky. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. If I remember correctly, it's uh, Middle West Spirits in Columbus is uh, the yeah. distillery, right? Middle West, uh, it's, you know, Ryan is, I like to say he's a patient person. Imagine being a master distiller and a, a bunch of young, I think a Kung Fu master and a bunch of young, you know, students come in and, you know, want to learn the crane technique. And so, you know, it, what you, I could spend hours talking about the philosophy of great whiskey making, right? Great bourbon making, but there's the truth in the patience of doing it the same way each time so you have consistency in your product. And let's bring Nick into the conversation because you're the managing director at Hollywood in Edinburgh and we're still waiting for your whiskeys, <laughs> but, and it's gonna be a couple more years. I mean, I know Robbo and Rob Carpenter and the guys and I've tasted the new make, and it's really good, but we're still waiting for that first whiskey. But uh, what in the hell prompted you guys to swim <laughs> the Corey Brecken for crying well, out as loud? As you noted, we, we're still waiting for our whiskey to mature, so we had some time on our hands. Um, before, I, before I get started, I was just speaking to Rob and Kelly who are on about to fly back to Canada tonight, and they just wanted to send their best best regards, Mark. So uh, just a little shout-out from them while they're at Heathrow Airport. Um, but when coming back to answer you on, on the swim question, uh, you know, me and my brother Alex, we're from New Zealand. We grew up near the sea. Uh, we've worked in whiskey for some time. And, you know, I liked what, what you were saying before, Scott, about whiskey being this journey, right? On, on our journey, uh, we've found that it's taken us very far away from our roots as Kiwis. You know, we, you know, there's, there's not much luxury whiskey drunk down in New Zealand. We're a bourbon nation. We love our Jack and our Jim and our Coke and, you know, go down and, Hey, wait, wait, a, wait a second, because I've been to New Zealand. I was there at my last trip before the pandemic was for Dram yeah. Fest in Christchurch. You guys are we, making some good stuff down we, there, and it's only getting better. whiskeys down there, but, um, you know, in the in single malt world, there is a luxury 
a- aspect to it, right? And what what Alex and I were feeling was, is you know, if you care about your single malt whiskey so much that you'll pay fifty thousand pounds for a bottle, maybe you should care about that. It is a product of of nature. It's from the environment. If if you care about the water of life, then let's start caring about our water. So, you know, we we came up with a silly idea to swim the quarry. That was that we thought well. That would that would be a good story to tell and, and grab people's attention in whiskey space and you know that's that's what got us started. Whiskey Go ahead, Nick. Keep talking. <laughs> yeah, that's. We're watching this right now, so go ahead and keep talking here. This is you yeah, guys swimming is, last is, Sunday. This is the swim. Um, as you can see, that water really moves through there. It's it's a, it's a tricky body of water. You know, the, it, the during the tide, what happens is, is the water will come through either end, and there's a pinnacle which comes off the seafloor, which sits 30 metres below the surface. And the stronger the tide is, the more inconsistent the swell is and the currents are through there. And so what you see is, is, is as we're swimming, you know, if you're normally swimming in a pool, you've got no current. If you're swimming in the ocean, you have a predictable tide that you're working to, right? Well, in the quarry, that's just not a thing. You know, one minute your arms are going left and you, the next minute your legs are going right. And it's, it's really quite messy water. And, um, you know, it's a little bit tickly swimming in that space and scott you were telling me beforehand about this dive trip that you guys have planned tell us what you're going to do diving wise that is uh almost as challenging as what these guys did well i don't know about that because uh i'll actually have scuba tanks <laughs> and fins on but you know what I get out of this, and, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, if we share this sense of adventure, it doesn't matter how old you get, right? And so for us, we call it Old Guy Red Bull. A few years back, we jumped into Normandy for D-Day. And so every year we sit around with a drink and we say, what's our next adventure, right? Wait Where a second, Scott. Go? Hold up, Scott. When you say jumped into Norway, Normandy. that means to the uh, jumped into Normandy. Yes. To most of us civilians, that would imply, well, I sort of flew over, got off the plane in Paris and drove and jumped in. You didn't quite do that. Let's explain the story behind that. So we'll start back. Um, in 2000 or, or 2019, it was the 75th anniversary of the invasion of France through Normandy. You had the Canadians, you had New Zealander partners as well. You had the British and the French and the United States and you know, you had uh, St. Mary Glees, all these things you grow up as a kid watching all these movies. And being the 75th anniversary, we knew it was going to be big and we wanted to take our families. So as we were getting ready to go over there, somebody approached us and said, hey, there's a airborne demonstration that opens up this ceremony with millions of people. And uh, it's a recreation of the early aircrafts and the early uh, jumpers. Would you like to go see it? We said, that's awesome. I'd love to jump in it. And that's how it started. We had to go back through airborne training certification again. Our kids learned how to jump. And we were given the honor of being the first two aircraft that came over the English Channel and lined up with Carentan France. We were in original World War II outfits. And we had horse soldier parachutes, right? Never miss a chance to brand your brand. (laughs) And we had five-gallon barrels and our rucksacks. And we jumped out over this beautiful French countryside and literally hundreds of thousands of people uh, watched us come down. And then uh, we broke open those barrels and we had some bottles and it turned into a glorious five day celebration. Now go on to the diving part. Now. Okay. How to beat that. (laughs) Uh, Last year with COVID, we were going to Japan because Tokyo was supposed to host the Olympics. We wanted a sumo wrestle and samurai sword fight and go up and uh, uh, meet Japanese distillers. That got pushed back. So this year we are went to Key West, Florida to the Special Forces Dive Qualification and recertified as combat divers. And then we're going to Saipan and we're diving on old World War II wrecks where the pilots and the remains are still sitting there around the islands of some of these most famous battles. And we're gonna try to recover those crews and bring him back to the United States. Well, wow, that's special. And that is special. Oh, we have, and we have, the we challenge. have tanks and fins, though. That's unreal. You mentioned this sense of adventure. And I can imagine that distilling, 
on a daily basis doesn't have a lot of adventure to it. But in reality, it is an adventure when you get into this whole business just because of the history and the stories, right? Okay. The history and stories are what drinking whiskey is yeah. about, right? You, nobody ever started a good story <laughs> over a salad. So if you learn about the history of whiskey, you think it started from your dad's bar when you're younger, you know, sneaking stuff. And then you think it was 50 years ago with Jim Beam or Maker's Mark. Then you, you, you get sucked into real history, the American Revolution and the Whiskey Rebellion. Then you learn about Ireland and Scotland and the history and how they brought this distillation process from the uh, Mediterranean, right? And then you learn about 3,000-year-old yak milk fermented, you know, that you possibly it, – it, it, as, as somebody that's curious about human history, it, it filled us up. Now what we had to learn is why is single malted barley a critical grain and why did Scotland choose that, right? Why in Ireland is it a mix of either a single malted grain or a multiple grain? And why did that distiller? So now you get further into the art and science of distillation. And we were curious on why the distiller made those decisions about the yeast. So this is almost like a MythBuster show you know what I mean? And Dirty Jobs meets a Discovery History Series channel meets Moonshiners. And for guys that had, you know, a great military career, it was everything we needed in our transition journey. And now I'm going to spend the rest of my life making something that possibly I won't be alive when it's served. Think about that. Fortunately, mat bourbon matures a lot faster than scotch. So I know, right? <laughs> Apparently so. But there's only two ingredients at the end of this. It's Mother Nature and Father Time, right? Those are the two most critical ingredients. And you cannot, you know, there's some new techniques coming out. There's some advanced uh, aging, blah, blah, blah. But our philosophy is Mother Nature and the quality ingredient she can give you. And Father yeah, like Time, the patience of waiting to let it become what it's gonna become. So Nick, tell me how you wind up going from New Zealand to running a distillery in Edinburgh, I mean, Scotland. I, I think the theme, a theme of this of this show is really, it seemed like a good idea at the time, right? <laughs> right? If, I'm, if I'm listening to Scott right? properly. You know, I mean, there's a bit here where I'm just resonating with so much of your story, Scott. I mean, when I was, when I was a kid, I left school. There wasn't enough adventure in my world. So, you know, I joined Royal New Zealand Navy. That was it. Let's, let's go. Let's go and do something different. And I think, you know, I just wanted to add that piece on if you've done a little bit of military training and you get out and you learn something really young, I just don't think you ever you ever lose that sense that that things just aren't possible. You know, you, you, you said, oh, yeah, we should go dive in Saipan. Yeah, why not? It's just the same thing as as my journey when it was like, actually, I really want to learn to make whiskey. So I'm going to go to Scotland. That That, that was how it started. Um, I was fortunate enough that in my first proper job, which was with Diageo in Western Australia, I had a great boss called Peter Warsfold who he said, okay, well, we'll get you to Scotland then, mate. <laughs> and off I went. You know, I'd never, never been there before. I had no idea what I was doing. I turned up at Diageo headquarters in Edinburgh and said, hey, I'm here, here to make whiskey. And they went, no, you're going to do sales. Here's keys to your car. You're going to go and look after a place called Dundee. And I was like, oh, gee, where, where's that? Drove up there and walked around, <laughs> knocked on doors. And, you know, it just I, – I just think that the, 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 the possibilities are endless when you just go, well, why not? Let's, let's give it a crack. So – you know, that's, that's really how I ended up up in Scotland. And the, the big dream and the one that's still something that I'm striving for is to, to go home and be part of that New Zealand whiskey making scene that you've talked about and take back 20 years worth of learning and go, okay, well, you know, just like Scott, how do we pay attention to the tradition and history in front of us, but how do we build on that? And, and how do we, how do we add to the legacy that we're already a part of? And I mean, that, that's what I'm doing at Holyrood at the moment. How is the whiskey come al coming along? Uh, it is Hollywood? tasting pretty fine, I, I must say. I mean, we're, we're really, we're really, 
trying to pay attention to the fact that our job isn't to be like the single malt set stand in front of us. You know, we're a very small distillery. We turn over 250,000 litres alcohol a year. You know, that's tiny. And um, we're in Edinburgh, which doesn't have a distinguished and long tradition of whiskey making. So we've, we, yet we're the home of Harriet Watt, the global centre of learning for distillation. So what we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to pay attention to the fact that uh, innovation isn't just a gimmick and um, you know if we're at a center of learning which which is what our home is then we really need to do some learning and we get quite inspired by new world distillers who are forced to do that because that's the path you have to walk for success so you know i'm not answering your question about how it is but i'm taking a free shot to say that we're doing some really really fun stuff at the moment you know we're, we're, we're working we're working our way through every kind of specialty malt that we can get our hands on to understand how that work how how the brewery nature of our city can have an impact on our whiskey. We're working with Harriet Watt postgraduates to, to look at, at how that specialty malt works under different fermentation conditions. Uh, we're doing work with different yeasts right now. You know, the, it, we're just really opening up a book on this. And what's happening is, is we're seeing the whiskies that we've got in the warehouse you know, we're, we're building out a very broad array of different flavors and styles. And, you know, you know Mark talks about our, our um, distillery manager, Mark Watson, talks about having as many colors on his palate as he can in terms of flavor. So there's there's some really surprising stuff coming out. We, we were in the warehouse on Monday um, for a team get together and we got to pop some casks and, you know, getting to try chocolate malt after after eight, six months was just a revelation and you know we, we start sitting there and it, just full geek out session right everyone's talking about how chocolate malt could work like a like a peated malt in terms of bringing a nuance and a body and a flavor to a young malt and the way that young pete does so yeah it's um it's pretty fun i think, <laughs> I think i'm gonna leave it there it's adventurous well, I got to figure that uh, the only reason you got to tap those casks were because Rob and Kelly came <laughs> over. So, uh, yeah. and please give my regards back to them when you talk to them next. Although I'm sure if uh, they're getting on the plane, they're probably already on the plane right now. So, uh, let's see. Uh, Graham Fraser, our pal in uh, England or in Scotland, mm-hmm. rather, says I toured Holyrood before the pandemic and was fascinated by their approach to develop flavor profiles and different wood finishes. Nick, when do you guys think you might have something we, we're in We're definitely about? going to start launching in September next year. Um, we've got a lot of stuff which is in a, looking like it's on the right trajectory to launch. Uh, one of the things that we're thinking about and taking some inspiration from is the way that North American distillers do batch releases. And what we really want to do is release small parcels of stock and have that as a real examination of our homework. You know, we don't want to get to 10 years and go, oh, hey, there's 5% of this thing is chocolate malt. We want to pull that out right at the start of the journey and go, okay, we're at three years now. This is this is what this looks like. So, you know, um, Mark's going to kill me for saying this live on air, but, you know, we, we should have north of 6,000 bottles across different parcels that we will start to release from, from September um, we've gone through a bit of a re-racking project at the moment where we can see how flavor is developing in different directions. So we're playing around with, you know, a lot of our early stuff was into first all bourbon. So we're, we're taking some in some direction with, with some Spanish oak and some with some, you know, American oak Spanish uh, season cask and also looking at some octaves. So there's lots of really interesting things that we'll start releasing from September. Scott, you mentioned the plans to build your distillery in Kentucky in Somerset, yes. and uh, you are waiting for a very important decision this coming week, aren't you? I think we are. You know, you, you first of all, it, it took us a while to understand, you know, the whole distillation process. Then we had to understand um, how to sell it, and now we have to understand how to build a brand for the next hundred years. And it was time for us to leave mom's basement, right? And we needed our own space. And we started exploring around Kentucky quietly. We talked to a lot of the companies and CEOs and COOs. And, you know, we wanted to find an area in Kentucky that there wasn't a lot of bourbon distilleries. And we were approached by this small town called Somerset, Kentucky, right on Lake Cumberland. There's no other distilleries around it. And it was such a beautiful small town. And the reason we chose it 
is I'd rather be a big fish in a small pond than a small fish in a big pond. So we learned uh, what it took to be able to build our dreams. And one of that is the support by the state of Kentucky and their, ter- their, their tourism incentives, right? Their construction incentives. So now I have to be a general contractor and I've got to be a developer and I've got to have architects and all this other stuff put together before we can even approach the state. So on October, or in uh, a few days coming up, the Kentucky Board of Tourism is going to vote on our package. And once that's approved, I can then finally give the final package to the banks and we lock in the financials for this. And we are going to build a beautiful 3 million gallon, 80 hotel room, 10 cabin, 15 horse paddock, 5,000 person. <laughs> in our wow. Line. We're going to go right. And uh, we're going to change the dynamics of what Napa did for California and what a beautiful, um, um, expression. Our architects are the ones that just finished McAllen's new distillery in Scotland, and it is a, a, a so far ahead for the next hundred years. And we get the chance, a blank canvas, to build that kind of facility. And you're talking 150 million dollars total for this thing. Wow! Every Holy time shit. you say it, uh, no, it, you know, it's hard to imagine a bunch of folks, you know, who joined the service. We didn't have two pennies growing up. Um, you know, we did our country's calling. When you leave the service, you know, that's it. You got to start a new adventure. And to, to hear, you know, that we're going to build a $150 million facility. First of all, it doesn't scare us, right? If somebody else do yeah. it, we can do it too. Uh, We know that it's the journey that we want to share with people. Just like we first went to our first craft distillery and became fascinated, I think there's a lot of folks out there that want to take that journey from discovery to being able to make some casts or come to the lake of Lake Cumberland. We're excited about the future. And finally, for us, think about it. It's the only thing we can give our kids. I can't pass a bunch of war medals to them. You know, they don't understand, you know, the history of what their dad did. They were just little kids at the time. But for this, for the next hundred years, we are building something for our friends and family. That is an amazing story. And we have a good question here now for a year from uh, Chris Radcliffe. Uh, Scott, uh, how much commitment do you have to employing veterans at Horse Soldier? And could the drinks industry benefit in working with veterans and with the skill sets they have? I know you do a lot of charity work for veterans, yes. but uh, there's got to be ways you can hire them too, right? There's several ways. So we are a partner with the Department of Defense SkillBridge program. In the SkillBridge program, the last six months of your career, right, you can transition and intern. And you can choose the career field you want to. So we have several members that are in the middle of getting out that uh, we can bring in and teach in business management or the sales side or the distillation side. So that's one program. Next is I'm on Team 43, and that's President Bush's kind of veterans um, club that loves to do mountain biking or golfing. I'm not that good at golf, so I don't get to play golf with them. But uh, we're focused on getting this generation maybe through the VA process, but back into the economy, right? America was built, if you look at almost all of your most famous brands in America, they were all built by veterans who either came home from a war and started a distillery, or they went back to the distillery after the war end. There's a very good book called uh, Bullets and Bourbons, And if you think from Bullet Bourbon to Maker's Mark to Pappy, you know, there's a history of service in this country and we're no different, right? Yes, we did great things, you know, one against many. Yes, we got a statue at Ground Zero. Yes, they made a movie. We got nothing for that. And that's okay. It's just what we did. And that was our service to the country. Now we serve something different. And so hiring veterans is in our DNA. We understand each other. We'll push each other to the limits that you can't typically do um, with a lot of, you know, um, you know, I hate to say the word civilians, but, you know, we have a different code of ethics and how we push ourselves. So, yes. 
you, you might say that you didn't question. come out with the cash, but you came out with an invaluable mindset, right? Like we talked before this about Harry and Andrew from Wolfburn and, you know, they, they did their time as well. And and the way that you don't blink at 150 million US dollars is because of that mindset of, okay, this is the challenge. Mm-hmm. What is What do I have to achieve on the other side of this? Great, it's a working distillery that turns a great EBITDA and I can employ people. The, the rules of the game don't change, but many people buckle under that mindset, I find. Yeah. I think, and you find you know, that with uh, in the military, people are shooting at you. In the distillery world, if this $150 million project doesn't work, the worst that can happen is the bankers come after you. Uh, but, you know, I see it as uh, there is yeah. no failure, <clears throat> right? I fully believe we can do it. I know if somebody else did it, yeah. I can do it, too. Now, the difference is, is I'm not naive enough to know that if I don't assemble the best yeah. team to help this project become successful, that's where you win. Um, why did we win in Afghanistan? It's because our Afghan partner, our agency partners, other uh, coalition partners. I fought a lot with the uh, New Zealander SAS, did plenty of missions, great human beings. We know we're going to succeed, number one, as we believe we can. Number two, uh, this is not a tough problem. Money is inventory, right? And uh, the economy is good enough that there's plenty of money out there, but it's also um, the most valuable asset not to squander. And we came from poor, humble beginnings, so the first thing we're not buying is boats and airplanes, right? We, we know where every penny is going to go for this 100-year vision, and that's what we're excited to build. There's a question here from Christopher Malloy that I want to, he applied it to bourbon, but I want to apply it to both of you. We know whiskey is a very crowded category. And with a lot of bottles that look and sound a lot like each other, how do your whiskeys, and he said bourbon, but I'm going to apply it to both of you. How do you make your products stand out from all the others? And what makes you believe it will succeed? And Nick, I want to start with you on Hollywood. I I think the most important thing is, is standing out from all the others isn't the thing that we're trying to do. The thing that we're trying to do is focus on our own journey and stay true to that. And I find that if we spent a lot of time looking at everything else within our space and comparing ourselves to the others, then we'd start to lose sense of what our mission really is. You know, our mission is clear. I'm using using that, that kind of lingo, but our mission is 100% to put Edinburgh back on the whiskey-making map. So that's how we stand out. If we're, if we're not doing that, if our liquid's not doing that, if our innovations aren't doing that, if, if, if what we spend our time making doesn't create something that people are interested in and they believe that Edinburgh has got something to say, then, then we're failing in our jobs, if that makes sense. And, and, that, and that journey in itself will set us apart from the others. Scott? You know, we started with what we liked, right? And if you have the passion, you know, it took discovery. Why did we like our rye bourbon and mixed cocktails? Why did we love the soft palate of a weeded bourbon? So we started with what we liked because you have to start somewhere. And today you see a lot of brands on the shelves. They're house of brands. Somebody's throwing a tremendous amount of this, lower shelf that or whatever. That's okay. I don't mind the competition. We learned three things about this business of making gray bourbon. Number one, it has to look good, right? Hence our metal label, our custom bottle. It's got to be on the back shelf, and it's got to say its own story, right? And, and this is the Holtz for Soldier Premium I'm holding yeah. up. So the wives, Elizabeth, who is Snow White, she spent her career in the perfume and skincare industry, somebody that sold... 5,000 an ounce perfumes understands packaging, right? So we knew we had to have great packaging. Number two is you have to have great juice because people will buy your bottle once. They'll try it, they'll hate it, and they'll give it to their friends if they don't like it. So we knew that we had to have the great quality and attention to detail. Everything you need to is to get your second uh, return customer, right? We want to be somebody's brand for the next hundred years, like my uncle and Jack Daniels, old number seven, he had a tattoo. He had every bottle he ever drank. He created a following, uh, you know, and, and that's what we want is that following that loves our juice. And three, the business side is you have to have enough of it. And, you know, the hard part, and I admire every craft distillery or startup because 
the journey is all uphill, 100% uphill. But you know what? A roller coaster ride, it, it starts cranky and slow. But once you get on that journey, it's, it's fun and beautiful. And so that's our three principles. Beautiful bottle, um, you know, great juice and enough of it to sell. Nick got a question for you from Kent Moore. He wants to know if you can tell us anything about green malt, which is unmalted. Yeah, barley, we, right? we we're not there yet, so we're 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 we're, we're roasting all of our malts at the moment. Um, so everything. I don't know if you know you the history of Edinburgh, but Edinburgh was one of Britain's most important brewing cities. Um, if you go under Arthur's Seat, there is a water reservoir called the Charm Circle, and you know, there's some there's some really strong brewing brands and brewing technology came out of Edinburgh. So, you know, I, I would love to get to Green Malt, but at the moment we're working our way through Crystal. We've just got a light chop, which is about to come in from our suppliers at Crisp, and then we're also looking at some heritage barleys. But I would imagine that we'll get to get to Green Malt in about a year and a half when we when we've worked our way through all the brewing specialties. And we have a question from H. Hemphill. Will Hollywood be considered a lowland whiskey like Glen Kinchy? And will you be doing uh, any peat as much as we're, we're, we're in the lowlands? You know, we, I, I can't stress em- enough how often people are asking me, what is your core range and what is your style? You know, we, we, are, we have walked away from the idea of core and we've walked away from the idea of style. You know, we, we are acting more like a brewer than a distiller and our exploration of flavor and techniques because we want to push the learning on things. So, you know, we've got some, we're, we're about to go into peat, you know, and, and we'll start laying down some peated stock uh, from, gee, when are we looking at the 12th of August is when we're on peats and we'll be on peat for about 11 weeks um, with, a, with a good deal of, of different levels of peat that we'll play with. But then we're also playing with different yeast variants and different fermentation times uh, to see, to see, how that affects peat in our space. I mean, it's just silly. I mean, we're taking some of the peat. We've got a we've got a pilot still, and we're going to rig the still up um, in the same way that you put a, a botanical basket in there for gin, and we're just going to stuff that with peat, and we're going to run that through like a gin just to just to see just to see what what's going to happen to oh. that. So, I mean, yeah. As far as styles like Glen Kinchy, um, you know. We, we, you could say styles like anyone. We're just not going to go there. Well, I'm talking. Well, I think they're talking yeah. more regional designations because it's where your distillery is located, not necessarily Correct. your style. Correct. And and you know, we, I was asked this question a wee while ago about style, and and I said, you know, in Scotland, you know, we, it, it, I think Scotch whiskey back a few years, twenty years ago, when classic malts came out, there wasn't that much knowledge about whiskey, so whiskey had to be explained very simply, so people could understand why you would buy a single malt and potentially how those flavors that you like, you could you could put them in a box and go back there again and again and and buy from the same box. And you know, I, I mean, I'm not an old bloke; I'm 42, and I started in the industry when I was 21. But the level of knowledge that's happened in the last 20 years and people understanding exactly what they're about. They don't need uh, regional styles anymore to guide them. I don't think they really want to know, you know, okay, what's your mash bill and, you know, okay, what, what wood profiles do you have and, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I feel like I'm blabbling, but <laughs> and not answering any, any questions. It's, it's okay. <clears throat> Scott, question for you from Tyrone Coty, our pal up in yeah. Halifax, Nova Scotia. What skills from your green gray days do you call upon most with mis- with whiskey mission. making? Oh. I'm presuming it's if somebody asks about your mash bill, you could tell them, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you. Well, and they take it be, seriously. You know, I haven't used that line. Uh, because I was a green gray, I could tell them, I could tell you, but I can't remember because I spent too long in the service and have been blown up. Uh, that's better. You know, green grays are very unique, and we're, we're more of the mountain men of special operations, the Navy SEALs, great hair care product, and they got fitness products when they get out, right? You have the Delta Forces, and they're the creatures of the night, but they only spend about an hour on the target. We live by, with, and through the people. So our way we survive is storytelling, right? And what is sitting with your friends? It's nothing but telling a story. What is sitting with a bartender on a bar is telling a story and sharing, So how we've been successful as a brand is, number one, uh, there's 12 men on an A-team and there's seven of us involved with this business. I can go to all points, northeast, west, 
sit at a bar or sit at a um, whiskey club and we do what's called whiskey and war stories. You know, there's a curiosity. Was I brave enough? Could I have done that? And then there's a fascination of how do you make good whiskey? All the while, it's an American story of, you know, we wanted to live the dream we've been defending, right? This ability to start something and we knew nothing about this business. And if we can do it, maybe you can too, right? Anything's possible on this journey. And everybody loves to hear that right? The success story, you know, they want to know the challenges, the, the hard, the, the austere, you know, you know, the silly question all the time, you know, how many did you kill? That's all irrelevant. You know what I mean? I survived. We all survived. It was the greatest time of our lives, but that was then. Let me tell you about what I'm doing today. And I would love to sit here and talk hours about goofy barrel stave combinations We've been messing around with rums and playing with gin. That is the fun side of distilling that most people don't know that each distiller then gets to get out of the old routine and play and really push this industry. You're going to see a lot of great things come out pretty soon. I think as a consumer goes from the beer crowd and all of those IPAs and different barleys and hop combinations, everything, they're going to mature and now start demanding from this industry more, right? More and new. Are you taking a chance and accelerating? And you know those that will uh, um, be ready for it will be successful. Those that will be traditional will be still traditional. Am I blabbering now? No, you're not blabbering okay. at all. Okay. But I, I do need to ask you about serious stuff because if you look yeah. at the real world today outside of the whiskey world, uh, the soldiers that followed you into Afghanistan are being pulled out now. Yeah. And my son uh, just returned from a year in Afghanistan. Imagine this war has gone on for so long that your sons are serving there now. So now as a father, I was quite worried. But then I have to trust just like, um, you know, my son had to worry about me when I went. Right. You have to trust that you're the best trained, the best equipped. You do it for the service of your country and your friends. Um, Afghanistan, I loved that country. It's beautiful, beautiful people. Um, honestly, in my own humble opinion, Afghanistan needs about 200 years in the oven. Uh, Afghans need to stand up and fight for what they want to represent them. And now will be a test over the next, don't think one month, don't think 90 days. You'll see a pendulum swing. There'll be some atrocities from the Taliban. They can't help it. Um, they claim to be religious and pious, but they're evil. And the Afghans will come back to where they want to be. I hope um, that they're able to, to become what it wants to become. And most of these Afghan people live in the same village they have for generations and never been more than a mile outside of it. And so now we'll see. What would you have done differently over the past 20 years to get us to a point where the U.S. didn't have to leave behind a country that still needed to be in the oven for, as so, you put it, 200 more years? Well, this I'll back my uh, self up. At the end of my career, I was a SART major in charge of the Interagency Task Force for Counterterrorism. You know, there is a lot of this country's and other countries capabilities that needed to be brought to bear and not just being told that the it's the army's problem or it's the american army's problem or it's nato partner problem you know other elements of governments needed uh you know to contribute and at the time i, I think we tried to make afghanistan mirror some of our Western ideas, and that's what's being rejected now. We, we're not that good at building a nation because we try to build it in our own image, and that country just needs stability. It needs economic capabilities. It needs uh, a sense of its own history and purpose. So at times, I can tell you this, there are Green Berets and other special operators to include our partners in New Zealand and Australia in over 55 countries at one time serving quietly, doing 
great things from digging wells in Africa and helping sort out famines uh, in, in, you know, other places. And those are the steps that, you know, create stability. When a country falls apart, it's like uh, all the king's horses and all the king's men can't put it back together again. It, it needs time. I remember, yeah, I remember back in the day, the Powell Doctrine, the uh, that General Colin Powell, later Secretary of State, had put out where you break it, you buy it. And well, part of his doctrine did we really uh, was not is, uh, put it in there? Did we not put the resources into uh, that we could have over the 20 years and four administrations? A uh, trillion dollars, you know what I mean, uh, is a lot for that country when maybe its GDP was 30 million. So Powell Doctrine really said, if we are going to use the military, use it violently and quickly and get out of the way, right? The army is not the mechanism sometimes of the government to apply aid, to apply um, partnering knowledge on how to establish legislature, to be the ones that distribute funds and financing and establish a budget that pays a host nation's so we, we asked our sons and daughters in the military, and you could have been a cook or an artillery person. Now you're the district governor's aide. So there's some things that, you know, we were successful when we did exactly what we were there to do. And that was to overthrow the Taliban government and to um, break loose al-Qaeda as an international terrorism network and syndicate. We did it. It's done. Nowhere in there was it rebuild the halls of Afghanistan and deliver a successful, functioning, modern, uh, democratic society. And we should point out that the Taliban and Al Qaeda are enemies of whiskey and alcohol in general. So screw them in that case. And I kid, well, of course. Uh, but you bring a very fine point. Uh, the philosophy of the Taliban and the oppressiveness of Al Qaeda is they hated everything that we consider part of being free. You know, the freedom, they would oppress women by covering them in burqas and only allowing males from their household to walk around. Your children uh, cannot play sports like soccer or even fly a kite, right? Your daughters could not go to school past the age of eight. This, you know, is what you hope that if they come back into some sort of power, you cannot erase Taliban from Afghanistan. You can't, it's been part of their culture. What you want to do is erase the extreme view of what they try to make everybody else and enforce it on them. So, you know, there are still a lot of people that hate the freedoms that we have in the West for simply because I don't know, maybe they don't have them themselves. Let's get back to Afghanistan and your experience for just a second. You mentioned the fermented yak's milk earlier. What did you guys take? You, you mentioned fermented yak's milk earlier on oh. in the show. What did you guys find that they were drinking over there that was, it wasn't whiskey, but it had to be something. It was uh, vodka, of course. You know, they still had the Russian influence. Um, they loved Johnny Walker Black Label. If you were the warlord, you had Johnny Walker Blue Label. Now the most prized possession was a bottle of Jack Daniels that they would present at a victory. So, you know, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. I've been to the edges in Africa and everywhere else. You wouldn't believe the brand identity of some of these products, right? I've been on the edge of the Galapagos and walked into a bar and you're like, look at that right there. And, you know, that's kind of our vision is one day, you know, imagine you build a brand and one day you walk in the most random place and on that back bar behind you, you see your bottle. And you ask somebody, do you know the story behind that? And they tell you, my work here is done. And, uh, you know, that's and I've done it. I've been to strange places here in the United States and saw our bottle immediately. And you can't feel prouder. I'll ask you one more question about Afghanistan, and then sure. we'll move on. Sure. We are facing 
a crisis in the next few weeks because of all the translators and interpreters who are trying to get out of there ahead of the Taliban. As the U.S. forces move out and are being brought home, there's, they're trying to get some out, but we still have thousands of people left over there who worked with the U.S. government who are being marked for death. Yeah. What should we do to try to get those people out? Well, right now, let's talk about, you know, unconventional things that you can do and support, right? And what's happening that most people don't see. And then there's the big halls of the government, the slow grinding wheel. You know, you've seen recently that they've adjusted the State Department. The State Department really is the mechanism of um, legitimately withdrawing folks with visas, right, and issuing them quickly. It was a failure. Uh, sneaking across the border, right, is now being closed because some of these host countries don't want the refugee status. Uh, Pakistan in the 80s and 90s was overwhelmed by fleeing Afghans, and they don't they don't want to go through that again. So you're going to see this humanitarian crisis, right? If there's so much instability because of the Taliban that these countries are going to block their borders, and then there's no way to get out anybody that has a legitimate visa or is you know a political um, you know person seeking asylum. So these are real things and life is at real time. And so we constantly talk to them about their best options. You know, also though, Afghanistan can't drain all of this intellectual talent because the Taliban is there. All the doctors, the nurses, the lawyers, everything that was the bedrock of what we tried to build for 20 years is going to become vulnerable because They'll just hide out and stop. They'll try to leave the country and bring their resources and families out. And Afghanistan will slip back 100 years. So they need to fight, too, though. Nick, unmute your microphone. You're still muted here before I ask your next question. Um, Graham Frazier wants to know why Hollywood decided on such tall stills and long line arms. <laughs> um, it was really to have some flexibility. You know, we've we've got a purifier at the top of the stills, which a lot of people don't know about, and and that just allows us to have a little bit more scope to, you know, if we if we want to send spirit back down, we can, and if we want to let it throughout the top, then we can. So we can play play across the the full spectrum. I want to go back to the swim across yeah. the Corey Reckon because it wasn't just you and your brother; it was a team of I think what yes, seven or eight swimmers, and. What did you guys do to prepare for it after doing the English Channel a few weeks ago? And that's just one yeah, in a series, it, it, right? it went in a series. So um, and my brother and I, we were back home in New Zealand uh, for the last four or five months. We, our dad's got Parkinson's, so we're back because we're just sitting at home and, and doing working from home. And there's no point being at home in London when we could be back home in New Zealand. So, um you know, New Zealand has been very lucky. We don't have any COVID uh, within the country. It's pretty much business as usual. And we we did so much swimming back home. We were, we were training uh, in the ocean at least five days a week. We did a pretty big prep swim in New Zealand. So where we're from, um, if, if you know, there's North Island, South Island. We're from the north. And we grew up by a big surf beach. And there is an island which is five and a half kilometers off the beach, which no one had ever swum to before. And Alex and I said, hey, let's let's swim there. That'll be good training. So um, we bet ourselves up to do that swim. There's a lot of current through there. Um, there's a lot of a lot of moving water. Um, and there's some uh, there's some big there's some <laughs> big marine animals that you just don't want to meet <laughs> in any in, in, in any moment in the sea. Um, there's a great white shark warning a few weeks before we went out. Uh, people were told not to swim in open water, and, and that, <laughs> that was our training. We, 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 and yeah, you went we and did it anyway. Did it anyway, I mean, you prepare for these things. So uh, we had we had a big chase boat, which would, would circle around us, keeping an eye out. Uh, and then we had two little Thundercat skiffs that would sit next to us. I mean, I mean it there was nothing you could do in that situation. They they had a they had a shark whistle and they had some tourniquet ropes. But you know if 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 something is going to come up from the deep to to have have its lunchtime snack. Um, <laughs> Wait a second, a shark whistle? What's that to call? Here, sharky, well, you, sharky, you can't sharky, really come here. Hear anything in the water when you're swimming like that? 
particularly when you get into your rhythm. You know, ocean swimming is about finding your zone and you just, you know, you don't want to be thinking, doing too much active brain. You, you just want your brain to be like driving your body forward. So, you know, if someone's calling out to you, you, you never hear them. So the, the idea of the of the whistle was if, if you heard a few sharp blows, then it was to, to get back up onto onto the boat. So, um, yeah, we, we were doing, you know, we had to do an acclimatization swim, a, a, a qualification swim of, of two and a half hours out in the ocean to show that we could, we could handle the channel. Um, and the channel really set us up, training for the channel really set us up for the Cori Brecking because um, the Cori itself is only a mile point to point. Uh, you know, we, we were conditioned for the cold for how long we're spending in the water in the channel. And um, so it was just really, you know, we were, that, that set us up to, to get over pretty happily. And Chris Ratcliffe wants to know, why whiskey smugglers? How do you decide a name when you could be anything? Uh, Explain the smuggling part here, because you're going to take all these whiskeys from all these swims and then yeah, blend I them mean, in bottles, so right? The, the idea was is if we if we swim with a little whiskey miniature and then we get it back to the distillery and we blend, we vat it back out and we release the bottles, I mean, that was what we did last year. And we, we didn't think it would be a thing, right? We just thought, okay, this is a crazy thing. Let's try it. And we had a partner in Germany called Christoph Kirsch. Uh, Kirsch is a great distributor, and, and they had set up um, fundraiser whiskies for Sea Shepherd, which is a charity that we swim for. Um, and when when Kirsch said, "Okay, we will do this. We'll we'll sort the whiskey for you," we thought that we might be selling a hundred or two hundred bottles on a limited edition run. I mean, these guys brought six. Uh, you know, reach our hoggies of Staisha from Buna, and I was like. That's a lot of that's a lot of whiskey, and then you know we, we sent the whiskeys back, and they 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 had an outturn of two thousand bottles, and when they landed in Germany, that that outturn sold in five days, gone, just gone, yeah. and and that was kind of where Alex and I thought, well, this crazy thing that we came up with that we thought would be a bit of a laugh has had a, had a bit of resonance. So, you know, when we're, when we're, when we're doing it now, you know, we, before we, we just called, we didn't even have a name. We, we just named it after our swim club back home. And then, you know, the, the whiskey smugglers title, you know, our, our friends over at the PR company were like, look, you just can't call yourself Nick and L. You sound like a pizza joint. And we're like, okay, well, you call us a name. And, you know, down, down under, you know, we love, we love like these silly names and, you know, the, our friends in Australia, our Aussies, they, they call speedos budgie smugglers. So, you know, we, we're always, yeah, you get it right. So, <laughs> we're always smuggling. And, and, you know, that first swim, when I gave the miniatures out to the team, to all the boys, you know, the first thing every bloke did was stuff the bottle down the front of their speedos. <laughs> and it just, it just, it just stuck. The smuggler thing just stuck. And, yeah, <laughs> bottles now liberated in that picture there. <laughs> yeah. And it was not just you and your brother. It was a team, mixed team, women yeah. and men, right? Yeah. Where did the mean, other swimmers come from? Because we don't hear much about them no, in the yeah, news so releases. We, it, was, it was crazy. So um, one of the girls at work, uh, Rach, she uh, had swum at the Commonwealth Games for Scotland. So, you know, she, she is like a killer pool swimmer. And she's one of our guides, and I found out that she swam. And I said, "Hey, hey, do you want to do you want to come over on the swim?" And she's like, "Yeah, of course, I'd love to do that." And um, she just pulled out of Team GB, preparing for the Olympics because her, her path is going in a different direction. So it was like, okay, we've got a girl from work who can swim. Um, and then Rob Carpenter was was going to swim. I don't know if you know this, but he's a he he has crossed the channel twice as part of a relay team. Um, but then Rob. I do not want to see Rob Carpenter <laughs> oh, in a speedo, man. though. Uh, I think that would be a pretty fine sight. Um, so, but then Rob and Kelly. The man <laughs> has no tan. <laughs> it is Scotland. Um, so Rob, uh, Rob and Kelly had to isolate because they're going back to Canada, and it was like you know, it was only last weekend. So um, when they when he pulled out, I was desperate to find someone else, and uh, a, a young lady called Lucy who works with me on cask sales. You know, she, she goes out and swims at Portobello every morning. And I was like, hey, do you want to come and swim this thing? And she just went, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> and just stepped into the gap. And she's a bit worried because she um, had an injury from a car accident, so she can't front crawl. 
Uh, and I just said, look, you know, this is the time you have to swim. You've got to be over in 45 minutes. Um, I'll, I'll swim. I'll swim right next to you. You, you do your breaststroke and we'll, and we'll get there. And, and, and we got over in 26. I mean, she, she, she was fast. Um, and then, okay, randomly, there are two other swimmers, uh, two best friends who are open water swimmers and channel crossers who just happened to be with us on the boat on the day doing the swim as well. And they said, hey, can we do this with you as well? And we we're like, absolutely. You can, you can become part of our little team. Where's your next uh, We've got swim? two more. So, you know, this year's we're, we're just building up a bit of street cred, right? We want to do – we really want to get some of the brands behind us. You know, it's easier for brands to sell bottles than, than two, two New Zealanders and their mates stuffing whiskey down their speedos. Um, so we're doing – the next one is at the end of the month where we're going to swim from Brook Laddie to Bermore. Um <laughs> Yeah, it has. Um, so, yeah, Br- Brook Lady to Bamore, which is five and a half K. Uh, and it's just Alex and I doing that because we've only got one pilot boat and we're just doing it as a bit of a test um, just to see, like, see water conditions, current and all that kind of stuff. And then the other one we're going to do is from Jura and we're going to swim across the Sound of Isla down into Port Escape, which is a bit of water that moves incredibly quickly. The, the distance isn't far, but it's it's really fast through there. Um, and those those will be the, the the two remaining whiskey swims, and then we'll start. We've we've got a plan for next year where we're like we love doing all the sea swimming, but we really want to take the swims inland, and so we've got an idea of we're calling it um, ten locks, ten drams. So potentially looking like uh, we really want to keep talking about our environment and the place that we live in, and we recognise not everyone wants to go and swim in the ocean, but the idea of visiting some of the water sources for whiskey in Scotland, there's some incredible locks that our distilleries draw their water from that people just don't visit. So what we thought would be cool would be to find a bunch of them, you know, tramp up to them or hike up to them, swim over them, stay there the night and then go and do another one and try and knock those off in one summer. Um, and then, and then release, release a whiskey, which is a blend of all of those whiskeys together. Scott, how, how wide is Lake Cumberland? Could they swim across that? It is probably the longest shoreline in wow. the United States for a freshwater lake, uh, probably 1,200 miles. So it was a dammed up uh, river that's now become a lake, and it is as deep as maybe one, you know, 200 feet. And it, How about it, the short end? The short end. Uh, if you want to swim across the bend with our distillery, yeah, it's it's a nice little swim. Uh, probably more my level than you. I won't be uh, using <laughs> speedos. Uh, I have what they call ranger panties, and they're light silky, so it's a little bit different. But um, and we were talking earlier. I had the Frogman swim here in Tampa Bay, so it is part of the triathlon uh, early season uh, certification. So we have a lot of professional athletes and triathloners that'll come here and it's January and they'll jump in and they'll uh, swim, you know, almost two miles uh, across. Wow, that's Tampa cool. Bay. I, I just, but when you guys do it, you're doing it in full special forces gear. Well, we have a team of seals. Um, I cheer them on. Like I say, I, I'm from the army. I could do a hundred mile road March, you know, at the drop of a hat. I don't know if I can swim across my <laughs> swimming pool to get a drink from my tiki bar. Is my ideas yeah. of water? I mean, it, I've been watching the comments coming up because Speedos is featuring quite heavily because it's in our chat. But um, <laughs> the, the reason we're, we're in them all the time is for open water swimming. For your swim to count, you you are not allowed to have any assistance from a wetsuit. And yeah, we were in, in wetsuits in the quarry, but that was more for safety because the water conditions is so unpredictable. But um, your Channel Swimming Association will not recognise you crossing across the channel unless you're in a one piece. Um, and that you know you, you just got to embrace embrace those rules sometimes. So <laughs> yeah, embrace the suck, just right? Roll into it. Yeah, uh, cool. Scott, I've been googling that this this Tampa Bay Frogman swim. I am excited. I think I think I want to come to America and do come and come and do that with you guys. I think uh, you should come down to our urban still house here. It's a, it's our our distillery down in Tampa Bay, and this is where we make rum, vodka, and gin, and we've got uh, so much uh, Oslo sherry barrels 
And this cool. is where we get to play. And, you know, it's fun having this second uh, setup down here in Tampa yeah. because there's no pressure. Our brand's doing well. The bourbon's aging and sleeping. And we really get to push the boundaries, especially for yeah. gins and botanicals. Um, you know, in Florida is very floral and fauna and, you know, it's got great things to experiment. But we really discovered rum. And so from fresh press sugar cane juice to vanilla sugars all the way down to various, you know, grades of black strap molasses. I think that's the part most people don't realize is what to do in between your day job of making a, you know, a constant steady um, product is in what between. you need to play with. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We have a question for you from Christopher Malloy for Nick. Do you know the gentleman from the Single Malt Review Ooh, from New Zealand? Who is that? That's not my, is that Michael Fraser Mill? No. No, that's Michael runs a uh, whiskey glory down in Christchurch. Doing some googling while I'm sitting here. <laughs> yeah, I'm, but but the question, but the question for both of you. What is Scott's favorite Scotch whiskey since you trained in Scotland and learned from a bunch of Scotch distillers and Nick's favorite bourbon since you mentioned at the start that New Zealanders oh, love their bourbon? Oh, oh, oh. I'll go first. I have to say Wolfburn only because I felt like uh, maybe somewhere out there was a day that I ran the stills, right? And I worked the, uh, the mills and everything, but, you know, uh, Bob, who was the deputy commander, loves uh, Glenn Fittich, McAllen's, all the basics. I don't have the taste buds for varying degrees of heavily peated uh, single malts, right? And all these other stuff. I, I just, I don't know what I'm drinking, right? So I'll share some scotches with some friends. I don't have any preference, but I just like bourbon. I just like it. <laughs> That's my jam. Okay. Um, oh, wow. Well, we, I mean, this is this is this is a great question, and um, we, we, what a, when people are, and I'm assuming you've not tried horse soldier I, yet, I, so you've not had. So we'll excuse you for not having a chance because I know you're not exporting yet, right, I, I, Scott? I was pretty jealous when yeah. you both held up a bottle, and I was just going to go. Um, but you no, know, I mean, so when when I grew up, you know, the, the bourbon that we all cut our teeth on was Jim Beam White, and if you're really fancy, then you got got Jim Beam Black. That that was that was as good as it got. Uh, and then when I got out of New Zealand and we went to Australia, Australia is actually a, a a really developed bourbon market, and people, you know, there's lots of great bourbons there. And um, if I was if I was going to feel really posh, then Wild Turkey. Uh, would be would be my go to yeah would be my go to, uh, but you know I just like long long branch is something that I've got a lot of time for, um, but everything Buffalo Trace does makes me happy. Every every everything like I just uh, I, it was the thing which opened my eyes to the sophistication of, of bourbon. Really, I was I was really when I got into into Trace and all the multiple expressions. That was that was just something that I, I couldn't get enough of. Um, but if I'm going to put it up there as my all-time favorite, mellow corn in the dirty old yellow bottle, I – yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a shot yep. of mellow oh, corn yeah. and, 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 and a pale ale, and I'm a pretty happy guy. There yeah. is nothing wrong with mellow <laughs> corn. Mellow corn, yeah. it just, you know – there's lots of yellow, mellow corn adventures I had growing up that I don't remember <laughs> I had them. Oh, fantastic. Hey, I, I saw, sorry, Scott, I saw, my, I, go I saw someone popped up go and ahead, said rum is, is the next thing. Look, I just wanted to throw it out here. There's, next yeah, it's the next rum gen. Is the next so we, gen. We, yeah. we, we are um, about to – our, yeah. our warehouses the, are the old Royal Navy rum bonds for Scotland. And we're we are now um, running a, running a fermentation on rum yeast, which kicks off next week, and we're going to start playing with rum stuff in our warehouse, and that includes uh, we're, we're looking at doing some collaborations with some Caribbean distilleries and getting running up a running up a, a liquid brief. And, and they make their new make based off the brief. We make our new make off the brief. And then we're going to swap new makes and let our whiskey go over there and have a good time and see what happens to it. And then they send their rum over to us and, and we leave it and we see what happens to it. I, you know, I'm not sure if rum's a new gin, but rum is going to be a lot of fun. When, when you said blackstrap molasses, Scott, Scott, I got excited. Well, 
Scott, when do you think you might start exporting? So, you know, we talk about this every day as a strategy. Initially, our strategy is it was based on the amount of supply we had, right? It's hard to tamp down. You know, we have a great story. We have a great bottle. Distributors always want more, right? And we just thought, okay, we, we, would, we would go deep and not wide. Focus on the states we're in. We're in California. We're in Florida. We're in New York. We're in Illinois and Texas and Indiana, Kentucky. And then we have to hold because we want to be stronger in sales because sales brings money. The more I sell, the more money I have to go sell. And that's the backside of the business we had to learn. There was no manual. There's a manual in a college on how to make great whiskey and bourbon. There's not a manual in college on how to sell the whiskey and bourbon you make because, you know, of all the other things um, that happens. You've got a distributor that has so much noise and so many screaming at them, you know, trying to get brand attention that you have to be the janitor, the distiller, and the head yeah. seller all at once. Um, so for our expansion, we want to go to Australia. We want to go to New Zealand. We've talked about the strategy in uh, England and then um, obviously yeah. Germany. But it's all down to the right time. We have and the right partners. We can stay grace over here. And you got to find the right partners, too, in those export markets. Well, it's like a marriage, right? If, if you don't know the background and history of your partner and uh, you're locked in, you'll, you'll be disappointed quickly and time is money. So as we learn and we get wiser on the business side of being a supplier, we make relationships that will tell us who's good and bad. This is uh, you either have a great relationship in this business or a poor relationship or you're unknown. And uh, half of it is just being patient enough not to make the mistake mm. with a bad relationship. Well, I think introducing you two tonight might help when you have your distillery up in Somerset running yes. and you've got all these excess barrels because Nick's going to need barrels <laughs> yes, at Hollywood. <laughs> Bananas, you know, we, you know, it was fascinating. We went to the Cooperage there in Scotland. I've been to Speyside. I spent about a month in Lebanon, Missouri at Barrel 53, nice. actually apprenticing to make barrels. And, you know, I, I can only tell people it takes 80 years to grow the tree, uh, uh, two days to cut it down and strip it, four years in the drying yard, maybe five days of assembly. And, and for number four char, it takes 45 mm. seconds. You know, there's a hundred years that goes into yeah. that bottle. And, you know, people should be proud of what Mother yeah. Nature has provided. And yep. it's the marriage of Father Nate or Father Time and Mother Nature. It's fascinating yeah. every time I see it. We've got a question from Graham Frazier. There's special yeast for rum. Need to know more. There there is yeah, there is special yeast for rum. So um, rum yeast just you know, they 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 start from a different place than than where where our barley start. Um, molasses yeasts they take a long time to ferment. So when we're talking to our partners in the Caribbean, they're talking about three week fermentations. I, I I said that to my boys, and they were just like, "What? No, that's that's definitely not a thing." Um, but right, you know, yeast uh, they grow and they evolve to the environment and the food source that they work with. And you know, rum yeast have grown in, in a high sugar concentrate environment, not at the same level as what what barley barley yeast and, and brewing yeast are, are used to. So, yeah, we we're pretty excited to see what happens. You know, there's been some weird stuff happening at the distillery recently. We did a project with Berry Brothers and Rudd where. Uh, we laid down a bunch of spirit with them where we took on some Bordeaux yeast and Burgundy yeast and Champagne yeast. And um, the Bordeaux and Burgundy yeast gave us you know, an ester profile that, that we just – we, 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 we just didn't expect, you know, I, I was getting messages from the guys in the distillery to say, come and smell this because this is just smelling like a sweet shop right now. And then we were all excited for the champagne yeast and it was an absolute fizzer. You know, it, it, it just, it just destroyed the distiller's yeast we threw it in there with and we didn't get a, We didn't get a good yield out of it. So, um, we don't know what's going to happen. And this is, this is one of the things where I'm saying with Hollyrood, our job is to go into that space where, and be be okay with failing or being okay with something not turning out the way that we thought it would because we we want to put more color to the white space. Well, guys, I'm going to 
call it a night because we've <laughs> killed an hour and 15 minutes of time that nobody's going to get back. And I really want to thank uh, both of you for joining us thank right you, now. Uh, Nick Ravenhall from Holly Road Distillery and uh, the Whiskey <laughs> Smugglers and Scott Neal from Horse Soldier Bourbon. Uh, you will find them in a number of U.S. states and online, and I will have my tasting notes for it on the show this weekend. Next Friday, we will have former Middleton master distiller Brian Nation from Ireland has moved all the way to Minnesota. He is in the process of moving as we speak wow. uh, to land wow. in Minneapolis at O'Shaughnessy Distillery and Keeper's Heart Whiskey and I do know that he was there during the past winter, so he knows, <laughs> he knows what coming. a Minnesota winter is going to yeah. be like. He knows oh, what he's gotten yeah. himself into. So that's coming up next week on the uh, Happy Hour Live webcast. Guys, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank I really you very appreciate it. Best of luck to both of you. And uh, Nick, good luck with the uh, next two swims. Which one are you swimming next? Uh, the next one we're doing is the Bermuda Brook Laddie. Be careful, have fun, and uh, watch out when you get to the dock at Brook Laddie. I know they've had some problems with that dock at times over there. Thanks for having me on the show. Thank okay. you all very much. Once again, that's our Happy Hour Live webcast from August 6th, 2021, with Nick Ravenhall of the Whiskey Smugglers and Hollyrood Distillery, along with Scott Neal of Horse Soldier Bourbon. Join us each Friday night at 5 p.m. New York time for our weekly live webcasts. You can watch them on the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel, our Facebook page, Twitter, and Twitch. And if you have missed a few of them over the past 18 months, they're all archived on the WhiskeyCast YouTube channel. Thanks again to Dewars and Redbreast, the presenting sponsors of WhiskeyCast, along with Sagamore Spirit, Writer's Tears, and Oban. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cast Strength Media, copyright 2021, and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.